Hi everyone, uh, my name is Devin Mystery. I'm a rhinologist and skull base surgeon with uh, Grand Rapids Ear, Nose, and Throat. Uh, in, I'm in private practice in uh, West Michigan. Uh, I uh, completed my uh, rhinology uh, fellowship at Ohio State University. My practice now largely uh, does focus on uh, complex disorders of the sinuses and skull base as well as uh, uh, tumors of the skull base. I've been asked uh, today to present on refractory rhinitis, updates in evaluation and management. I have uh, no uh, disclosures or conflicts of interest. I'm certainly not a consultant or an advisor to any of the uh, companies and, and certainly none of the ones which will be featured uh, today. So uh, today with the objectives, uh, I'll be uh, briefly reviews, reviewing the subtypes of rhinitis and their typical presentation. Um, uh, certainly keep that part uh, uh, a little bit uh, shorter and brief uh, so as not to be uh, patronizing. Uh, that we'll then uh, review the current uh, medical uh, management recommendations and discuss the uh, surgical management of rhinitis, which is continuing to evolve as we see more and more devices and novel techniques uh, 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 on the market. So rhinitis is a very common problem, obviously uh, evaluated both in the uh, primary care clinic and uh, by the olaryngologist. Uh, it's defined technically as inflammation of the nasal mucosa, uh, characterized by two or more symptoms of nasal congestion and obstruction, uh, as well as anterior or posterior rhinorrhea. They don't specify clear versus thick or anything like that. And sneezing and itching for at least one hour a day for more than two weeks. Uh, Non-allergic rhinitis affects 30 million Americans and 200 million people worldwide. Allergic rhinitis affects one in four in westernized countries and two to five billion is spent annually. Uh, we know that allergic rhinitis, while uh, it doesn't land people in the hospital and certainly isn't life-threatening, it is a huge healthcare expenditure. Uh, and uh, racks up billions of dollars uh, on taxpayers and uh, 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 health care uh, or health insurers uh, annually. We can divide rhinitis into various subtypes. There's allergic rhinitis, obviously very familiar with that. And we know that there's a strong association with asthma and allergic rhinitis. Uh, and then there's non-allergic rhinitis, which has further subtypes, uh, vasomotor rhinitis being probably the one that's most familiar and commonly identified. But there's also non-allergic rhinitis with the eosinophilia syndrome, uh, probably less uh, uh, commonly made diagnosis as it usually takes nasal uh, uh, cytology to make the diagnosis. But we do know that it has a strong association with aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. That 50% of people with this will develop AERD in their lifetime. Those are the Samters patients with, uh, uh, with nasal polyposis uh, and aspirin sensitivity. Uh, there's gustatory, senile, hormonal rhinitis. There's drug-induced or medic, uh, 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 rhinitis medicamentosa. And then there's uh, atrophic rhinitis, typically seen in the elderly. There are many comorbid conditions uh, that present alongside with uh, rhinitis, uh, both allergic and non-allergic. In children uh, with allergic rhinitis, it's un not uncommon for uh, uh, nearly two thirds, or once, excuse me, nearly one third of them to present with otitis media with effusion, or vice versa. Obviously, with allergic rhinitis, conjunctivitis is very common. Chronic sinusitis and anosmia uh, uh, has overlapping symptoms and, and, and can present uh, in a comorbid fashion, although I do think that association is a little bit more, uh, or we make more of that association than what is actually supported uh, in the literature. But nevertheless, 50% uh, of those people. Who present with uh, uh, rhinitis uh, if, uh, when uh, administered upset uh, tests uh, have been de have demonstrated uh, to have some degree of hyposmia. 26% of children have chronic sinusitis. We know that it coexists with depression and anxiety and can certainly exacerbate those uh, um, underlying disorders. It affects uh, sleep quality both from an obstructive standpoint but also from an inflammatory standpoint. Uh, there's laryngeal irritation, and globus sensation, and then, of course, asthma. Medical management of uh, rhinitis obviously uh, starts with nasal sprays. And, of course, intranasal corticosteroids are the mainstay of therapy for uh, treatment of both non-allergic and allergic rhinitis. Uh, 
Those are well documented. There's plenty of evidence to support that. Um, the other medications that are commonly used have uh, varying levels of evidence, and that, that's what I'd like to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, uh, topical antihistamines work well for allergic rhinitis, but can also help uh, non-allergic rhinitis patients in certain uh, contexts. And probably the most beneficial relationship or uh, um, evidence-based uh, uh, medical therapy that I, that I employ in my practice is the combination of an intranasal corticosteroid and an antihistamine. And it's the synergistic effect that seems to take place between the, the, uh, the interaction of these two medications, or at least their uh, therapeutic benefits that uh, seems to uh, uh, manifest uh, uh, best in uh, patient outcomes. And that is one that I, I certainly use very commonly. Anticholinergics, of course, uh, Atrovent is a mainstay for vasomotor rhinitis and certain types of non-allergic uh, rhinitis. Uh, older drugs like mast cell stabilizing agents like chromalin sodium can certainly be used. I think those are of more historical significance than uh, 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 current medical standard of care, but certainly uh, have, have a role. Um, one therapy that I use uh, more and more commonly uh, in my practice is topical capsaicin. When I first heard about this, I think it w I had seen it pr prescribed by my uh, uh, fellowship director. I thought it was crazy to be blasting people what is, with what is a, effectively uh, pepper spray. This is not prescription. It's uh, considered all natural. You can order it on Amazon or find it at health food stores. Uh, and sometimes it's combined with other medications, but there is good evidence uh, for topical capsaicin for both the management of allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. And uh, it's been shown on a variety of different uh, uh, endpoints, both uh, sneezing and itching, but also uh, post-nasal drip and rhinorrhea and obstruction to improve patient symptoms. Uh, it starts with certainly uh, an increase in symptoms just from the uh, topical aspect of the capsaicin, but can certainly improve the uh, 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 with uh, uh, regular therapy. Um, I, I also use it in my practice commonly for the management of facial pain disorders as uh, probably from the benefit of downregulation of bradykinin. There's also drugs like anti-leukotrienes. Uh, these are a, a singular. I think this is a overprescribed medication, uh, at least in the management of rhinitis. Uh, it's certainly less effective than antihistamines and intranasal corticosteroids. And it should not ever really be used as a singular therapy uh, or in isolation. Uh, really, this is, this is a medication that's added to a current regimen that includes a nasal steroid and antihistamines and other therapies. It, the combination therapy is far more effective in asthma than, than in allergic rhinitis. Of course, continuing on medical management, there's immunotherapy, uh, like subcutaneous uh, immunotherapy and sublingual. These are uh, uh, employed uh, very commonly, uh, both by the allergist and uh, otolaryngologist. Uh, some evidence for intranasal immunotherapy. I don't think this has uh, gained a, a certain amount of uh, uh, traction, at least in the U.S., but uh, there have been uh, some studies that have looked at uh, this, as well as epicutaneous. And perhaps the most interesting one that I've come across is intralymphatic uh, immunotherapy. It's not something I have any familiarity with in practice, but uh, there are studies that have looked at uh, uh, um, antigen introduction through inguinal nodes uh, via an invasive, you know, a percutaneous procedure, uh, but interesting outcomes in which patient symptoms after administering a single dose uh, via uh, an intralymphatic route uh, were diminished for months to years at a time. Uh, so perhaps someday we'll see uh, intralymphatic immunotherapy being administered by perhaps a, uh, an interventional radiologist or someone of that sort. Um, certainly a new frontier to explore uh, for the immunologist. And then there's biologics. Biologics have gained a lot of traction in the management of, uh, of uh, uh, asthma, uh, and certainly with recent FDA indications in the management of chronic sinusitis. But in terms of uh, uh, rhinitis management, uh, not not nearly as much. There is Zolair, uh, omalizumab, which is an IG, anti-IgE uh, uh, antibody, has been around for, uh, I think, nearly 20 years now. It's approved for management of allergic asthma, uh, and it is effective in reducing symptoms and reliance on daily meds in patients with allergic rhinitis, but it doesn't have an indication uh, for uh, solely the management of allergic rhinitis. And, and to date, there are really no studies looking at some of these newer meds like Dupixent and Mepolizumab uh, on uh, 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 the management of uh, or on outcomes related to allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis.
So we'll move on to surgical management now, which is kind of the meat of the uh, of the lecture. Um, surgical options include a variety of different therapies. Uh, the mainstay of therapy is uh, really, uh, or at least the most uh, evidence-based therapy that's been around the longest is the inferior turbinate reduction. Nasal airway surgery, with or without a septoplasty, certainly addresses the symptoms related to uh, rhinitis uh, and, and can be effective in uh, reducing reliance on medications. It doesn't typically alter the underlying disease process, uh, but uh, that's not always uh, available in the as physicians. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on inferior turbo reduction. It's a, a, a procedure where everyone here is familiar with and, and probably uh, regularly performs. But we will discuss in much more detail posterior ne nasal nerve ablation, the vitian neurectomy, and then uh, Botox injections. Um, inferior turbo reduction, obviously there's a variety of different options and uh, techniques that are commonly employed, including radiofrequency ablation, coablation, and submuco submucosal resection. Uh, it improves the airway and symptoms of instruction. There is some data to show that it also improves rhinorrhea uh, and, and symptoms of, uh, of congestion. Uh, I think some of that data has been shown with devices that also have some a form of bipolar uh, cautery. Uh, but nevertheless, I, from my own anecdotal experience, uh, some mucosal resection certainly can improve uh, many of the symptoms related to uh, rhin rhinitis, including, uh, or not, not limited to just uh, a, the obstructive symptoms. Moving on to the uh, selective parasympathectomy. This is the posterior nasal neure neurectomy. Um, this is a, a selective transection of the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, uh, which uh, emanate from the sphenopalatine ganglion uh, and travel the, with the sphenopalatine artery through its foramen. Um, this is a very precise procedure. It's performed uh, generally under a uh, general anesthetic, uh, and it is a very similar technique to a sphenopalatine artery ligation. Uh, it's been uh, described uh, probably in the last I think it was initially described in the 80s, but really put into more, more into practice in the last uh, 15 to 20 years um, uh, to avoid some of the outcomes related to vitian neurectomy, which we'll discuss. Uh, it, uh, in doing this, we identify the posterior nasal nerve as it uh, exits the sphenopalatine artery foramen and traverses the uh, vertical process of the palatine bone on its way to innervate the middle turbinate and inferior turbinate. This eliminates uh, risk of transecting fibers, uh, uh, postganglionic fibers to the lacrimal gland, and avoids the risk of a dry eye. It's a very uh, selective procedure um, and requires some familiarity with the anatomy in that in that location. Uh, but uh, it involves uh, elevating a flap uh, just over the uh, uh, posterior fontanelle and the region of the vertical process of the palatine bone, and more specifically the crista aphmoidalis. So in these, uh, in these uh, anatomical descriptions here, you can see on the left the uh, posterior nasal nerve exiting the sphenopalatine foramen, uh, and then uh, as it uh, branches and arborizes over the middle and uh, inferior turbinates. Uh, in these uh, images from uh, Peter Wong's uh, paper in Stanford, we can see the uh, region just uh, 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 posterior to the uh, uh, root of the middle turbinate uh, um, and uh, the region in which the uh, uh, posterior superior nasal nerve uh, emanates. That technique uh, was recently uh, adapted into an in-office uh, procedure. And so there, this has uh, now gained a significant amount of traction and is probably has been employed by many people, I'm sure, here uh, following along. And that's the posterior nasal nerve ablation. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the initial device, which, was, uh, which gained FDA approval, I think uh, was made available in 2016 or 2017 and has certainly been uh, used much more commonly in the last uh, year or two, uh, at least in our community. Um, this... Um, T typically requires topicalization. It's performed in office and on an awake patient. Uh, you can use uh, or forego uh, any uh, sedation. Uh, 
um, but typically requires some amount of topicalization for anesthesia with or without a sphenopalatine artery ligation, or excuse me, sphenopalatine artery injection of lidocaine, which uh, we'll discuss as well. Um, there's two proprietary devices available for this. There's the cryoablation technique, which is Clarifix and made by Stryker. Uh, and then there's the uh, radiofrequency ablation uh, wand called Ryanair, made by Aaron Medical. Uh, I've used both of these in my practice fairly commonly um, and happy to discuss any of the nuances related to either one. Uh, again, I don't provide any consultative uh, services for these companies. So um, starting with the uh, cryoablation uh, or Clarifix procedure, I wanted to look at the outcomes related to this because it is a new device and it's gained a lot of traction there are, um, uh, within the uh, clinic for management of uh, rhinitis. But, you know, there, aside from nasal airway surgery, there haven't been too many disease modifying treatments or surgical procedures available for rhinitis and so I was a little bit skeptical of the evidence for this when it first came out wondering you know something that's as immunologically complex as rhinitis could a single dose treatment or procedure really uh, alter the underlying uh, process in such a way that translated into real and sustainable outcomes. And so the initial paper that came out for this device was uh, done by the Stanford group by Peter Wong and I, probably some of our colleagues who are presenting today. Um, uh, and and the, the initial studies did show that after a single treatment on each side, uh, there was pretty, pretty good uh, symptom reduction, which was statistically significant. And this was measured at 30 days, 90 days, six months, and a full year. They looked at total nasal symptom scores, which is a, which is a validated uh, uh, questionnaire. Uh, related to uh, for rhinitis related symptoms and of course they specified uh, sneezing, itching, congestion, and rhinorrhea and, and not only show that was there significant reduction in symptoms in both allergic and non-allergic patients but that um, these were sustained up to one year. And you can see the, uh, the endoscopic pictures of the treatment, post-treatment effects and then at 90 days follow-up. Um, and, and that is something I do typically counsel patients about is that there is a delay in onset of the uh, of, uh, symptom reduction and it, uh, it does take some patients. So continuing with the outcomes, um, one thing that I've been interested in is just identifying who are the right, who is the right candidate for uh, this procedure and, and really long term how effective is it. So um, the uh, uh, group at Henry Ford with John Craig uh, did a nice study that was published in the last year. I think this is actually a multi-center study uh, looking at what were uh, preoperative factors that could really identify who would be the most successful with this procedure. And what they, what they, the only thing that really showed statistical significance was initial response to ipratropium was predictive of uh, rhinorrhea improvement after posterior nasal ablation, excuse me, posterior nasal nerve ablation. And, and that's been my experience as well. Um, the uh, Peter Wong uh, also uh, in the Stanford group also did a follow-up study which was published this uh, past August which looked, uh, uh, which was uh, multi-center in nature and again looked at um, uh, reduction in symptoms at 30, 90, 180 days and, and nine months. Um, this was a much larger cohort of patients. I think uh, nearly 100 patients were treated, um, and they did. They, they showed very similar outcomes as uh, prior uh, in their prior study that were both uh, sustained up to nine months. But most interestingly in this study was that of 54 patients using intranasal medication at baseline, 35% uh, of them. Uh, we're able to discontinue use. And this is something I do counsel patients about a lot is that the overall success rate of posterior nasal nerve ablation is probably 70 to 80 percent. I do think that patient selection is key, uh, but that even then um, to promise that a patient will be completely able to forego and eliminate uh, nasal sprays or immunotherapy or something like that is probably a lofty goal that most of the time we're just trying to make patients symptoms specifically their nasal obstruction sensation of congestion post nasal drip more manageable and less bothersome and uh, it's really only about one-third of patients are able to completely cease use of their uh, 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 intranasal medications. Um, this study out in Northwestern with David Conley uh, recently published as well looked at uh, uh, a second spot of treatment in the inferior meatus and they showed that uh, um, 
that the, the inferior meatus has a sole location of uh, um, uh, uh, posterior nasal nerve ablation was as effective, if not more effective, than treating in the middle meatus at the uh, root of the posterior nasal nerve. And this has since led to a um, uh, to uh, people treating multiple sites, both the inferior meatus or along the inferior turbinate posteriorly and uh, in the region of the sphenopalatine uh, artery foramen. And I think that also improves outcomes long term. So I'll show you a video here. Uh, this is myself doing, uh, uh, performing using the Aaron Medical uh, Ryanair device. So this is a patient who had previous endoscopic sinus surgery, I think at an outside facility, but came to me with uh, pretty severe postnasal drip and just really rhinitic uh, symptoms. Um, so you can see me here, I'm using this electrode array. This is a radio frequency wand. I, the, the patient's already been topicalized and had a sphenopalatine artery ligation. And this device requires a 12 second application in each spot. They typically recommend multiple spots. And so you'll see me moving this to various locations in and around the root of the middle turbinate. The, uh, you can see its relationship to the posterior wall, the maxillary sinus. And then you'll see me maneuver this down to the uh, posterior aspect of the inferior turbinate and in several locations along the uh, inferior turbinate. With this device, you don't see tremendous mucosal changes, uh, which is in contrast to the cryoablation where you will see active freezing of the uh, tissue. So posterior nasal nerve ablation, pearls and pitfalls. Um, I think it works best for vasomotor rhinitis patients uh, because of the selective parasympathectomy that really is occurring. Uh, it's less effective for allergic rhinitis patients. It doesn't mean it's not appropriate, it's just you need to counsel the patient properly. If a patient has concomitant or coexisting chronic sinusitis, it's really going to diminish the likelihood of success. If that patient is complaining of a post-nasal drip that's bothersome and their sinus disease and their si inflammatory sinus disease hasn't been addressed appropriately, they're really not going to get nearly as much benefit from this. 20 to 30 patients, 20 to 30 percent of patients don't even have a response to this uh, uh, procedure. Um, and the complications include epistaxis. I think that's a very rare uh, uh, and infrequent one, but Theoretically, you're, you're in the region and working in the region of the sphenopalatine artery. I did have a lady recently where I injected the sphenopalatine uh, region in the office, and I accidentally put the needle right into the artery and developed uh, some pretty good pulsatile epistaxis upon removing the uh, needle. Um, I was able to easily control it just by holding a pledget on it, um, but obviously it was a little disconcerting for the, the uh, patient. The big risk with cryoablation is a post-procedural ice cream headache, which can be very severe and last hours at a time. Um, I think the most data or data has shown that a pre and post procedural SPA injection can help prevent that. And it's very difficult to predict who that will occur to um, or, or occur with. And that, that risk is really minimal, if not totally eliminated, by uh, uh, use of the radio frequency device as you're not freezing any tissue. The other thing that's really important is to counsel your patients that the results can take up to eight weeks to appreciate. So moving on to the video neurectomy. A video neurectomy was first described in the 1960s. It used to be performed through a transantral and open approach. Uh, it's obviously in, uh, long since been uh, adapted to an endoscopic approach. Um, the video nerve is formed by the junction of the greater superficial petrosal nerve and the deep petrosal nerve within the foramen and uh, lacerum. Uh, and then it exits uh, that region, traveling in a small uh, foramen or tunnel, typically on the floor of the sphenoid sinus, although it can be invariably located in the pterygoid canal as well. Um, and so the anatomy in that region can be a little bit more complex, but in this left, uh, in this left uh, image you can see that the deep petrosal and greater superficial petrosal nerve coming from the facial nerve coalesce uh, at foramen lacerum and then travel along the sphenoid sinus. And on this coronal radiographic or CT, you can see the uh, Vidian uh, uh, canal on the uh, lateral aspect of the uh, floor of the sphenoid sinus. The Vidian uh, nerve is a landmark that we use in endoscopic skull based surgery. It leads uh, to foramen lacerum and it helps us identify the petrous portion of the uh, 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 carotid as well as uh, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, periclival portions of the uh, uh, carotid when uh, resecting tumors. So it's a commonly used landmark uh, for those, uh, for those uh, structures. There's two approaches for performing a vidianorectomy. One is the antegrade and one is the retrograde approach. An antegrade approach is performed through an extended sphenoidotomy. Uh, 
and uh, the median nerve is isolated within its canal along the floor of the sphenoid. You typically have to drill or open the canal and then uh, isolate uh, circumferentially the nerve and remove uh, two to three millimeter section. Uh, the benefit of this is uh, this procedure is it doesn't necessitate a SPA ligation. Uh, it just if you're familiar and comfortable with an extended sphenoidotomy, it can be performed with relative ease. A retrograde approach begins with an SPA ligation. The typical technique for an SPA ligation in uh, identifying the cristaethmoid allies, the sphenopalatine artery foramen, and then uh, the opening the pterygopalatine fossa. We would typically displace the pterygopalatine ganglion inferiorly where you can then retract the uh, vidian nerve in its preganglionic position and uh, ligate it. Um, I wouldn't typically recommend that procedure for a, a, a uh, vidian nerectomy performed in isolation. That's typically used in a trans approach uh, when we're addressing uh, JNAs or tumors of the, uh, or excuse me, uh, like a lateral uh, sphenoid sinus and cephalus seals that are in a deep uh, lateral recess. So this is a uh, vidian nerectomy that I performed um, a couple of years ago. I've already performed here. You can see a extended sphenoidotomy with a wide sphenoid open. I've drilled out the vidian canal, and here I'm putting a ball tip probe around the uh, vidian nerve in its canal. Um, I'll then advance a uh, bipolar into the field um, where I uh, uh, then uh, cauterize the nerve and uh, transect it, uh, a, a small section of the nerve here. And this patient had an excellent outcome, but you can see that some of the mucosa in that region has already been cauterized. Uh, I typically will prophylactically cauterize at least branches of sphenopalatine artery, most specifically the branch of the superior turbinate, which you uh, typically will encounter in an extended sphenoidotomy. Um, and so here you can see me uh, cauterizing the, uh, the nerve. And then here you can see that the nerve has been transected and that's its cauterized stump. And remember that within the canal also runs the vidian artery, so don't be a uh, you may get some brisk, uh, small arterial bleeding when performing this, but it's usually very easily controlled. Um, a video nerectomy is more effective than a posterior nasal nerve ablation because you are uh, uh, um, transecting those fibers, but uh, um, you need to have familiarity and comfortability with an extended sphenoidotomy and a potential SBA ligation. You should also know that because you're uh, transecting the preganglionic fibers to the sphenopalatine ganglion, it's uh, possible to develop a dry eye and that 30 to 50% of patients in studies uh, will develop a dry eye postoperatively. I would say that in my experience that's less so uh, and certainly we ligate this in, in uh, endoscopic solvate surgery all the time without uh, complaints of dry eye postoperatively but um, nevertheless studies have shown that almost always the dry eye will resolve in one year. Um, that most of these patients develop collateralization to their lacrimal gland, but it can still be disconcerting for a patient. And know that because of the, just the nature and the anatomy in this region, there's an increased incidence of postoperative epistaxis. So moving on to Botox injections, is not something I have any uh, personal familiarity with, but I know of people performing it. Um, the idea is that in, uh, the uh, uh, interruption uh, and preganglionic uh, disruption of uh, uh, release of acetylcholine um, uh, helps uh, reduce the parasympathetic tone within the uh, uh, nasal cavity. And so these uh, injections are performed typically in a very similar region to the uh, posterior nasal nerve or along the length of the inferior turbinate. They can be performed in the clinic just after topicalization. It does require a significant dose of Botox on each side. Usually 25 to 50 units are used. And the duration of effect is shorter than cosmetic use. Uh, usually lasting at maximum three months. Um, but studies have shown on this that, uh, in, in, in this particular study, that patients do love it, um, that many patients uh, uh, in the treatment period are able to completely eliminate all reliance on medications, and many patients, in, at least in their studies, came back for repeat treatment. So perhaps this will be a more employable uh, service in the clinic. Um, like I said, I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with it. So the only other things I'll discuss are the caveats and concerns. Know that when you're uh, evaluating non-allergic rhinitis patients that, um, that, uh, that, that non-allergic rhinitis can be a presenting complaint for 
um, both Wagner's and Churg Strauss patients, as well as sarcoidosis and malignancy, that um, uh, just because it walks like a duck and talks like a duck doesn't always mean it's a duck. That uh, if there's coexisting uh, friability of the tissue, epistaxis, erosion, and certainly significant crusting, maintain a high index of suspicion for these. I can't tell you how much worse a patient can get if they are operated on or uh, in, in uh, the setting of these vasculitic diseases um, or uh, certainly if they're neglected. Um, and so always have a low uh, suspicion uh, for or low threshold to check labs, autoimmune labs, or even obtain a biopsy. Infective rhinitis is less commonly seen, but certainly can be seen postoperatively, and it typically involves biofilm uh, forming bacteria like Pseudomonas and Klebsiella. I have seen this postoperatively several times, and typically it presents with extremely sensitive mucosa, uh, where patients I can't barely even put the scope in the front of their nose without them being exquisitely sensitive to the touch. Usually the tissue is also hyperemic and you see kind of like a thin hazy glaze over the mucosa, almost like that um, honey glaze uh, that you see with staph on the skin. Um, and it does, it is usually well treated with oral antibiotics and of course topical antibiotics can work well. Where do we see future directions? Um, future directions, I, I think, like uh, sinusitis, will become more tailored. As we become more familiar with the endotyping of, uh, of rhinitis and not just the subtypes, but understanding the, the molecular mechanisms driving the various subtypes of sinusitis or uh, rhinitis, we will see more tailored therapies. And that's what we're seeing in chronic sinusitis management is that now we're dividing chronic sinusitis with polyps and without polyps into further subsets, TH2 and TH1 driven mechanisms and trying to identify which uh, um, molecules along the pathway can be inhibited. I think we'll see more novel delivery devices for topical therapy. The first one is the exhalation device uh, for topical steroids, which has uh, been uh, uh, recently developed. I think there will be a greater role for biologics, even though these aren't employed heavily in rhinitis yet. I think there will be more and more of this. And then the most important thing is just more collaboration amongst specialists. I can't tell you how often I'm working with other allergists and pulmonologists just on, under this notion and understanding that that really the the air, airway is, a, is unified and that diseases that affect the nose affect the lungs and are ultimately under uh, the underlying issues are the immunological pathways and, and mechanisms and so collaborating with your local pulmonologists, um, allergists and uh, various other uh, otolaryngologists I think helps in uh, delivering more tailored and patient specific care. So with that, uh, we'll end the uh, discussion and, and move on to uh, any uh, questions that you guys might have. Thanks.